Hey everybody, welcome to the Werewolf Bar. I'm Brian Easton, the author of the autobiography of a Werewolf Hunter series, and this is Whiskey with the Werewolf Hunter. So it's good to be back with you on what will be the third episode of our third season here at Whiskey with the Werewolf Hunter. So let's start off like we do most times uh, with our creature of the night. Uh, now this is a bourbon called William Wolf, and it will serve as a reminder to me not to, uh, to go to the whiskey aisle without my cheaters. Because when I picked this out, not only did I fail to notice that it was uh, 60 proof, which is about 30% alcohol and a bit, you know, light in the britches for a bourbon. But it's also a flavored whiskey. Uh, and not only is it a flavored whiskey, it is a pecan flavored whiskey. A flavor that I have never really much cared for. Not right out of the shell, not in a pie. I just, I just don't like it. But I am a believer in giving things their day in court. So I'm gonna go ahead and share it with you tonight. Now I picked it, as you can see, it's got this really cool little wolf track on the, on the top, and it's got this uh, banjo picking wolf on the, on the label there, which is what initially drew me to it. So let's see how the, how the creature works with a, a pecan to you. So that's very sweet without much of a kick to it at all. And it tastes something like what old ladies might sip while they're playing canasta. Uh, on the bright side, the pecan flavor doesn't really taste like pecan to me, so, so that's good. Uh, I can actually, you know, probably finish it. Well, that'll teach me definitely to take my glasses with me uh, next time I make a whiskey run. So tonight we are proud uh, to bring you the latest interview in MB Press's Legends of the Werewolf Hunter anthology uh, scheduled for press next Halloween. We've invited a slate of authors, as we've been talking about now for several months, uh, to contribute, and their stories will each be connected in some way uh, to the world of Sylvester Logan James and Michael Winterfox. So this month, Miles Booth over at MB Press had a chance to sit down with the redoubtable Sarah Lunsford, now, Sarah writes under a cast of pen names uh, with a range uh, that has won her fans in a half dozen different genres or more. She is a one-of-a-kind lady with a big heart and a great talent. And uh, here's Sarah Lunsford in the hot seat with Miles Booth. I want to see the things that I have nightmares about up on the screen. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Hi, I'm Miles Booth, and this is our interview series with the Legends of the Werewolf Hunter uh, anthology that we're putting together. Of course, that's based on the works of Brian P. Easton, Autobiography of a Werewolf Hunter series. Those books are the Autobiography of a Werewolf Hunter, that's book one. Book two is Heart of Scars. Book three is The Lineage, and book four is The Winter Fox Journals. We are waiting for book five which Brian is working on uh, as we speak. Tonight, we're interviewing Sarah Lunsford. Sarah, how are you tonight? Great. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thanks for, for making time to be here. Um, Sarah is a uh, multi-genre author and has published a, a great many books. Um, and I want to start things off tonight by asking, how did you come across Brian's books? How did you first get introduced to the autobiography of a werewolf hunter world? Um, a search on Amazon. I was looking for more werewolf entertainment and has popped up and I was like, well, let's give it a shot. And I'm so glad I did. It's one of my favorite series like ever. How long ago was that? Oh, I don't know. It was only the first book out at the time though. So. Okay. All right. So that's, that's a little while back. Good. When did you first get into contact with Brian? 
Um, right after I read the first book, I hunted him down on Facebook to fangirl all over him <laughs> because it was amazing. I was just so impressed with the writing and specifically, like, it just spoke to me. It grabbed me and it shook me. And I was like, I need to tell this author just how much I love what he's done. So I did. And we just started talking and sort of became pals. <laughs> Good enough, good enough. And I should point out that every author loves to be contacted by people that have read their works and, and really enjoyed them. Um, that's universal. So anyone that's watching this and wondering, should I contact the author? Yes, yes, you should. Uh, find them and, and encourage them. And when did he uh, let you know about this project? You know, I'm really bad with dates. When he did bring it up, though, I just... I jumped at the chance. I was so excited to be able to play in his dark little bloody sandbox. I was like, oh, yay. If you don't mind, will you tell us a little bit about the story that you have planned for this book? Well, at the outset, it will seem like pretty much every other werewolf story, you know, young people go out and they go camping and evil things are afoot. Um, but my heroine has a certain bloodline that they tried to stamp out. And she might be going to visit her Aunt Ro and bringing her crew with her. Ah, okay. All right. There might be shades of the most dangerous game. Maybe, you know. Cool. Very cool. It's good times. Lots of bloody fun. <laughs> well, that's, that's definitely part of the series, so... Very cool. That's uh, That sounds exciting. You've read a lot of werewolf fiction, I take it. Where would you... Quite a bit. Yeah, where would Sorry. you rate Brian's works? I've done my fair share of uh, holding his works up as, as the best of the best. Um, that's all very well documented. Where do, you, where do you put him in the pantheon of werewolf fiction? The top. Definitely the top. It's... I recommend his series to everyone I know who loves werewolf stuff and it's just like, here, no, you have to read this. Like, no, you don't understand. You need to read this right now. <laughs> Stop everything and read this stuff. Exactly. Exactly. And of course, one of the things that, uh, that we've talked about that I've talked about with him is our hope that at some point this gets put into a film or a streaming series or something like that. So that's, uh, that's something that's absolutely part of, of the background of this project uh, and us, us promoting it. And you, uh, you mentioned to me at some point that you've had uh, your works mentioned before. So if you don't mind, um, and you've done a lot uh, of writing out there. Which of your works would you uh, – well, you've had options, film options on at least one of the books that I know of, and possibly more, which of those works would you like to talk about? Tell us more about what kind of writing you do. Well, I do a little bit of everything. Um, the work that I did have option for film was my memoir. It's called Sweet Hell on Fire. It's a year in my life when I was a corrections officer at an all-male max facility. Um, and it's been optioned several times. Never quite made it to production but it's still nice to be optioned and you know to go through that process that's how that goes um so the first time i came across that i love that title that is a great title is that the title you came up with or is that a title um, that kind of went through the machine and came out of a quote well, my editor my editor came up with the title but it was something that i said i said it's fairly often back in that time of my life I was it was like a swear that wasn't quite a swear you know uh -huh. like yeah. when I woke up hung over and like still ready to puke through my nose I was like oh sweet hell on fire yeah just like oh and she was like, that's that so good we're, <laughs> we're gonna <laughs> do that <laughs> so it, it is absolutely yours um because I can't remember like if I'd heard that expression before or not but it fits perfectly for that and, uh, and I had a chance to read uh, a bit of that while doing research for this interview. Um, and that is some intense uh, memoir, <laughs> we'll say. So, uh, but it's very uh, gripping. It's, it's wow. 
kind of stuff. Thank you. Um, It was what made me turn my attention more toward romance than horror. I mean, I love the genre and I still write in it occasionally, but it was what made me want to focus on romance more was that I've seen so much awful. Can I, can I swear? Are we swearing? Yes. We're adults. Okay. Thank you. I saw so much shit, (laughs) you know, and that job was like drowning in shit every day. And I just wanted there to be more hope. But I think that horror is about hope, too. A lot of people think it's weird that I write romance and horror and thrillers, but I think that it's all about overcoming darkness. Sometimes it's like literal demons, but sometimes it's internal demons. And I think that it all meshes together well for me anyway. I totally agree. Um, So how many books have you written? Oh, I think I just turned in book 74. 74. And you just you couldn't you couldn't do any more than that. I mean, really, just seventy. <laughs> a lot of us are, are, are still in the single digits, but that's okay. Um. Well, I write full time, and if I have ten hours a day with my butt in this chair, there's no reason why I can't produce that much okay. because this is I what I want to do, you know. But when you have like a day job and kids or other commitments, I mean, it's hard. I totally get it. It is a challenge when you have other things that are distracting you. Tell us, because I know that you write under several names. Tell us those names so that everybody watching can look these names up. And then tell us a little bit about what each genre or uh, each each author writes. Because on your website, tell us your website. Okay. Um, you can get there any number of ways. You could get there with CorvusCoraxBooks.com or saranadewilds.com, sarahlunsfordbooks.com, sarahwild.com, saraharden.com. <laughs> okay. All right. And uh, Corvus um, Corvus is cool, by the way. I like that. Um, oh, thank you. Tell us a little bit about each um, each pen name that you have and the name that you write under and what genres that represents. Um, Sarah Lunsford, which is real me, is my memoir and my thriller, and um, I plan to write horror going forward under that name. Initially, everything was under Serena the Wild, but then I learned about branding and uh, author packaging and things, so I've had to divide things up a little bit. And I've done that so I have a brand, a specific brand for each name, so readers know exactly what they're going to get. They know if it's going to be small town romance or if it's going to be paranormal or if it's going to be contemporary. So they can just look at the name and know, hey, this is the thing that I want and this is what she delivers every time. Okay. Let me branch off on that for a little bit. So you have uh, you have editors, you have publishing houses helping you to understand what the current marketplace is looking for as far as branding and as far as putting yourself out there on the market. And that's, is that the motivation behind this or? Um, I've mostly learned that. I learned that in conjunction with my traditional publishing because I'm a hybrid author. I do independent publishing and traditional. Um, And when I sold to Harlequin, they wanted a name that was just Harlequin. And they were like, this is why we want this. You know, so they know that this is a Harlequin product and then I was like oh that makes sense and then going forward with what I've learned with my indie friends and you know just watching those things like the the also bots on Amazon like people who are going to buy my werewolf story probably don't really care about my small town romance and that's totally okay but I want to make sure that I'm delivering what my reader wants right sure yeah that's that's golden advice for the other authors out there that are just starting to make their way into self-publishing and things like that. As far as each name goes, tell us the genres that you write in. Um, Serana is, Serana DeWild is paranormal romance and urban fantasy. Sarah Arden is small town romance. Uh, Sarah Wild is new adult 
which sometimes has romance and sometimes doesn't. And it doesn't stick to normal genre rules. When you buy her, you don't know what you're going to (laughs) get. It's sort of, it's about people finding themselves. So there could be all sorts of things happening in these books. Um, See, did I leave anyone out? Oh, Sarah Ravencroft is a new name. I decided to branch out with because it's dark paranormal and these stories are a lot grittier. Like I'm going to be launching a monster romance line. And I don't mean like the Bigfoot Sasquatch crap. I mean, people who like that, Hey, good for you. Yay. But that's not me. Like, um, it's just going to be a lot darker. Like this new series is going to be Russian mobster vampires. Okay. And I know that's hitting like a bunch of tropes, but I mean, it's going to be really gritty. I'm going to base these characters on the experiences that I've actually had with people like this. So it's not going to be any of that close the door on the violence. It's going to be bloody and scary. And these people are going to be bad. (laughs) You piqued my interest. Oh, really? I'm down with that. Um, Oh, I don't know. What do you want to know? Um, I have 18 books planned in the series. Um, And mostly it's, you know, it's got that criminal underworld sort of flavor. And then you throw in the whole part where they eat people. I mean, you know. (laughs) Absolutely. Let me ask you this. 18 books. How long do you see each book? How long do you plan to make each book? How many words? What's the word count on that? Probably 60,000 words. Okay. All right. So standard novel. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a uh, that's a lot of of stories that you have mapped out. Is that pretty typical for you when you when you create a story and a storyline? No, actually, um, when I first started out, I was much better at standalone novels, but that's not what sells as well in my genre. People like series, exactly, and so I'm trying to give them what they want, trying to produce those different stories. And I think the world that I've built is really big. So there are room for all of these stories. And there's, there's not really an overarching plot after the sixth, after the sixth book. That one's like a sort of a family drama of these brothers who were created in the gulag in like the twenties. And so it's about them and their rise to power. And then after that, it's just more people who are involved in like the vampire organized crime. So. Okay. All right. And is this going to be straight vampire or are we going to see other monsters working their way in? Um, There'll be other monsters in my, in my first book, the villain's a werewolf. And um, in romance, there's a lot of like shifter werewolves. And again, no shade to the people who write it or the people who love it. I mean, I've written it. But this is a werewolf. This is a howling style. I will eat your face, werewolf. Okay. All right. All right. You seem to. I'm not sure, but you seem to kind of definitely take a take a turn towards the more menacing monster uh, image. Now, maybe some of you other like, stuff. Go ahead. Yeah, I I really like that image because I think it speaks to the dark things in all of us, the things that we don't like about ourselves, the things that we're afraid people are going to see and aren't going to love us. And I just want to bring that out and be like, okay, this evil, awful thing happened, but this person still deserves validation and love, which is really super touchy feely. I know, but I can't help myself. (laughs) It's it's not, it's all like getting, getting that, that emotional baseline that everybody exists on. So, which, which you have to, you have to write from that place to have it resonate at all. Um, so it doesn't, doesn't sound too, too touchy feely. I mean, they're eating some faces and they're mobsters, and, you know, so I think, I think it sounds pretty, uh, pretty good. I want to read that. <laughs> awesome. I'll send them to you. <laughs> I'm down, down for some of that. Um, who are your inspirations? Oh, that's so hard because I think an author is inspired by everything they consume. Like, Enough. Books, media, their friends. It's, Let me refine that question. <clears throat> uh, who who are some of the earliest works? It could be books, it could be movies, whatever you like. Uh, they really just made you say, wow, I got to do that for a living. I want to well, write. Oh, okay. I, I have that one. It okay. was at my eighth birthday party. 
my mother had decided that she wanted to scare me because I wanted to be scared. I'd been watching that day scream theater all the time. I don't know if they had that in your area, but it was like in the afternoon, they would play these really like B horror movies on cable. And it was just my favorite thing. And I don't know why, but it was. And my mom said, if you really want to be scared, we're going to watch the exorcist. And I was like, yeah. Okay. And I had this slumber party and my friends all had to get permission slips from their parents to say that they could watch this at my house. And after I watched it, I was blown away. I was like, holy shit, I want to do that to people. (laughs) I mean, that was my first thought. And now that I'm older, I can say, you know, that movie was about more than just horror. I mean, it was about the gamut of human emotion. I mean, it really goes through like familial love self-love just this whole gauntlet and I wrote this really terrible story about this paraplegic girl who was possessed by a green mist and killed all of her friends and it was just it was bad but I wrote it in green colored pencil because you know the mist was green so it had to be green of course but that was when I decided I wanted to be a writer so (laughs) all right fair enough eight years old exorcist That's a pretty legit story. <laughs> Definitely. What uh, what other works would you point to as, as early inspirations? Um, well, I started reading romance novels at a very young age. My mother gave me one when I was probably 10. And she said, you know, here, I think you'll like the story. She had paper clipped those parts so I could skip them. And I did skip them. I was like, no, no. Like, I don't know how people look each other in the face after they do these things. I don't want to hear about it. Don't. Mm-mm. No. <laughs> I have an 11 year old and I have a pause button from any movie. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> exactly what you speak of. But I just fell in love with the storytelling. And so some of those early authors, um, like Bertrice Small, um, you know, Joanna Lindsay and the standards from the 80s romance novels were pretty much my inspiration um but then (laughs) i fell in love with the howling because it was the first movie to scare me Uh it scared the shit out of me and i was so happy (laughs) yeah absolutely um but then i started realizing that i could write paranormal romances after howling six i don't know if you've seen that one it's about the the guy who gets the werewolf who gets captured by this carnival and a vampire's like running it and he falls in love with this preacher's daughter it rings and he chooses not to eat her (laughs) it rings a bell but i'm not sure which which howling that was the last howling that i watched it was a group and they were all going to a castle they'd been invited and i don't remember what happened that's my daughter's favorite one. Is it? We watch that one all the time. <laughs> okay, which one was that? Do you know? Is that is that five? I was going to say it's either four or five. Yeah, it's either four or five, and the one with the vampire is like five or six. I can't. I think it's six. Okay. All right, it was a while back that I saw that one. Why does she like that one? Why does that one resonate with her? Because of the end. Because in the end, it's the woman that you wouldn't expect who's the werewolf who eats everyone. And she just she, she just loves it. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> she kind of exalts in her werewolfness. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so, okay. All right, so talking about the movies, um, have you ever done any writing for the screen? Um, actually, I am very interested in screenwriting, and I have written my first screenplay it's called alpha bitches <laughs> and it's about werewolves of course Wait. and what happens when an entire prison is turned and these officers okay. who have to survive the night <laughs> all right all right this uh this sounds very cool um have you by chance come across ben temple smith's work called welcome to hawksford no i haven't all right, it's a graphic novel, but check it out. It's werewolves uh, in a prison setting. Not not exactly what you're talking about, but it's awesome as far as werewolves in a prison setting. Um, so you've written a screenplay. 
And how would you uh, how would you describe that process as different than writing prose or a novel? Um, it's very different because you have to build everything in dialogue. And I had to learn different, um, like a different language to put that on paper. Yeah. And there are lots of formatting things that I didn't know. And <laughs> so, yeah, it was a much different experience and I really enjoyed it. It is fun. Um, and it was, it was actually inspired by, um, <laughs> as was one of my other books. So when I was working at the prison, we got this new um, pepper spray, like a gel. And the delivery system is silver nitrate. So, of course, it made the connection in my brain. Like, right oh, away. so it's werewolf <laughs> repellent. <Yeah. laughs> All right. So silver nitrate is something that, uh, that a lot of hospitals use as an antibacterial agent, if I remember my chemistry correctly. Um, and I've, I've had that thought as well because it's, it's an antimicrobial, but also <laughs> anti-lycanthrop. Uh, uh, you know, qualities there as well. Um, so do you use any particular uh, software brand? Because uh, I've done, I've dabbled in screenwriting and there's a uh, software called Celtix. And it's C-E-L-T-X that I actually really enjoyed. I kind of messed with some other stuff, but that one's very simple to use. Uh, what, which one do you prefer? Um, I just got Final Draft because okay. that's what, Everybody, I, Hollywood. Uses. The producer who, yeah, well, the producer who um, initially optioned my memoir, I had told him that I was interested in learning how, yeah, to bring things to the screen, and he mentored me a little bit. Um, it was kind of him to take time <laughs> to do that, and that was what he recommended to me. So that was what I bought. Okay, and I think Final Draft is the industry standard, uh, but Celtics is free, so. It's a place to start. Yes, I had heard of Celtic. Yeah, okay. Good. All right, so do you uh, do you mind sharing with us any any shameless promotion of this screenplay uh, that, that you that you would tell us a little bit more about it? Um, well, I it definitely needs to be rewritten <laughs> because you know it's like anybody's first novel, it's usually not fit for eyes, but um, I had a really good time writing it. What's the gist and of it? Just explain it in a little bit more detail. Okay. <laughs> um, there, are these, there are these two officers who want to be on the SWAT team and they get this gig that they have to transfer a special management inmate out to another facility. And then there's the storm and the generator shut down, and suddenly all of these, everything gets super quiet, and then everyone transforms in their cells. And so there are just like these two officers stuck in a cell house, like the old school cell houses that are all like stone and like brick and just that and all these monsters and they have to figure out how to get out. And when they do, they end up finding people from the SWAT team and they go to the armory and they hole up in there. And then they find out that the commander of the SWAT team is a werewolf. And then like every time that they go and they try to find another person to help them, they end up being betrayed. So they're like the only two people and the special management inmate who is a werewolf hunter, of course, <laughs> of course, of course. And so they end up finding, <laughs> they end up, you know, going into these tunnels beneath the prison that leads to the river. Um, they were like old mines. And that was loosely based on the prison that I worked at because there were like all of these old mines under there and they had been sealed off and they were all creepy and gross and awesome. <laughs> all mines underneath the prison. That, that writes itself. You're like, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and then they find out that the head psychiatrist who works at the prison is the alpha bitch and so they have a big face off with her and my two heroines of course there's a b story that's a romance and they fall in love and um one of them is a werewolf but she's like a wolver i don't know if you know that myth it's like an irish werewolf who does good 
they run around and leave food for hungry people and I'm not I'm trying to think that's kind of like the uh, the the dom pier of werewolves or sort of I just could be yeah yeah and they just do good things and they do good works and they are focused on helping people and they don't eat people okay which was a good option for my heroine but not usually the kind of werewolf that I write about <laughs> oh right but it sounds like you've got you know the traditional eat your face off werewolves so it's nice to have a little balance that works and that was one of the things that um you know, I would think about when I would go to work since my brain is always writing. Like anytime I've had, I've had tons of other jobs because, you know, my parents were like, no, you can't be a writer. You know, you have to have a backup job. <laughs> we've, we've all heard that one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I've had tons of them. I've, I've poured concrete. I worked for an airline. I've worked for a prison, but anyway, back to working at the prison, you know, I would sit in the tower and when there wasn't a mass movement or something, I would look and be like, so what would I do if this happened or if that happened? And then my brain would go to like, what if werewolves overran this place? Like, how would we keep them in? Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's another, another author trait. <laughs> like, what would I do if there was a sudden werewolf attack here? Yeah, you got to think about these things. And it's better to be prepared. I mean, honestly. Right. <laughs> Can and I'm always looking for the bodies too, you know, like when we go places, like I'll be out with my husband and I'll see places and I'm like, yeah, there's bodies there. Oh, definitely. Yeah. You're looking at a place. You're like, there's, there's more than one that's been hidden there and you know it. Absolutely. And he's like, you're a romance writer. Why are you thinking about murder? Like, well, <laughs> that's just what I do. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't forget. <laughs> so do you see this, uh, this, screenplay that you've done is it a feature film or is it a streaming series or do you have it uh positioned for one or the other or or could it be either it could be either i think i think it'd be really fun to do a series yeah like a walking dead sort of it said it reminded me of that i was i was picturing it that way but sometimes people are like no this is the feature film so gotta find out let me just tell you, I am a literary whore. If you give me money for my book, I don't care what you do with it. You want to make it a series? Do it. You want me to write a screenplay? Do it. You want yeah. me to write a Twitter series? Fuck it. I'll do it. Just <laughs> Every author, every realistic author, I think, is in that same boat. <laughs> you know, the, the days of standing on your, on your point of, no, it has to be presented this way. That's, you're not going to get anywhere like that. So, yeah. You're like, if you want to present my work... <laughs> You know, once you've paid, you are good to go <laughs> to take it in whatever direction you want. So that's, uh, I think a lot of people see things that way, definitely. Do, uh, how many of your works have you had optioned? Um, just that one, just the memoir. Okay. Um, my current romance release has been shopped, but. Didn't really go anywhere, but, but that's okay. It's still exciting to have someone approach you and say, hey, we think that we might be able to sell this to Netflix. What do you think? Like, yeah, okay, let's do that. <laughs> like, sounds good. Thumbs up here. Um, tell me this. How has the pandemic changed that process for you, if at all? Um, have you seen a lot more attention from the streaming services? I would say yes, because they're always looking for more content. And when you are producing content, like I do, they're like, hey, what are you doing? You know, you want to come over, have a drink? And I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> Virtually, of course. But there's so many of them out there. now. So, you know, there's a lot of hungry mouths to feed. And that's, that's another thing that uh, I think about a lot. I'm like, God, there's so many people and they're all looking for content. And they're looking for content to compete with the other person's content so once you see something pop up on the radar you know paranormal anything you're like wow they've got it now the other guys are gonna have to get something like that going too um time to time to get this work out there so it's something that i really do hope uh the the, the book that we're doing uh for for the ryan's anthology um i do hope it gets some attention and i hope it brings attention to all the authors but i also you know, I would love to see his world on screen. Yeah. That would be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I could do feature film. I could do streaming either way, but I'd be, I'd be very psyched to see that. Um, 
So that's that's definitely something to be aware of. And I think it's something that a lot of authors think about a lot too. And I do very much like that the streaming phenomenon has, has presented itself. Because for the longest time, it was like, hopefully we'll get a movie. And then if, you, if it made it to TV, that was almost like, you know, sitting at the kids' table. Because um, it didn't turn out that well. Or very rarely did it turn out well. Uh, but now, all new ballgame. So, you know, people, people have changed. The world has changed and entertainment has changed. So here's to, here's to all of us being able to, to sell content. Hell yeah. And get it out there. Absolutely. All right. So what's, what's your next, your next big release that you have planned or recent release? I should say either way. Um, my most recent release is a happy little book called Fairy Godmothers Incorporated. Okay. And it's about a trio of fairy godmothers who are basically the Sanderson sisters if they decided to use their powers for good okay. and matchmaking. And um, they need to refill the wells of love in their little town of Ever After Missouri. Okay. <laughs> And so they try to get their charges to do a fake wedding to help them build their wedding business. But of course, they fall in love along the way. And um, I had a really good time writing that because I think I had almost finished it when I got COVID. <laughs> and the whole world went to shit. And I felt awful and everything was awful and bad and terrifying. And writing that book, I had to choose every day. Like, this is what I believe. I believe in happily ever after. I believe that people are going to persevere. I believe that good things are going to happen. And I had to choose that to write that book. So that's what made that book special for me. Ooh. And it got an Amazon editor's pick, which was really nice. That's also very helpful. Definitely. If you uh, don't mind, tell us a little bit about your COVID experience. I know everybody's curious about that with everybody. How, how bad did it get you? Well, I'm going to be blunt. I almost died. I, um, when I went to go get tested, the nurse at the, um, at the health center said, she's like, you need to be in the hospital. You need to go. And I went and they had no beds. So I went home. Um, but I was so sick that I couldn't walk. My husband had to carry me to the bathroom I had a fever of 104 for two weeks. I had some memory loss and some brain damage. I had to relearn homonyms. I had to relearn how to walk. It was just, it was awful. It's the worst thing that's ever happened to me. I wrote my kids letters for them to read after I was dead. You know, I mean, it was that serious. <clears throat> but then I recovered and had a hysterectomy right after that. <laughs> Well, my summer was kind of full. <laughs> How long from, you know, the first time you felt bad to like the next time you felt good? How long was that, that time period? So the next time I felt good, um, I would say recently, it left me with chronic fatigue syndrome, which sucks a lot. Um, I haven't really felt like myself until... I don't know. I would probably say the last couple of weeks and it was last March that I got it. So. Well, I had no idea uh, asking that question that it was that traumatic for you. So I'm sorry if I brought up some bad memories there. Uh, that's, oh no, it's okay. I was thinking about writing another memoir. <laughs> I mean, but what kind of asshole writes two memoirs, you know, I'm like, what kind of pompous dick bag, but I think it's that, an experience. That's that's that right, I'm going to buy it. Like, cause that one, <laughs> is somebody going to, cause here you go. Um. <laughs> um, my husband had it too. He still works at the prison where I worked and that was how he got it. And he, for him, it was just like, he was uncomfortable. He had some tightness in his chest and he was tired and had a little bit of congestion. Right. And then it just hit me like a brick. That's uh very, very severe, obviously. Uh, I'm sorry that that happened to you. Um, and it's been 
really crazy. That's why I asked because it's been an all across the board uh, experience for for different people. So some people just had a little something. Some people didn't know that they had it, uh, and then some people got slammed. And we still don't have a lot of information about why any of that's happening. But I guess that's something that'll fall out over the next however however many years. Um, but I. So sorry. I'm glad that you're feeling better. Now, Thank you. <laughs> that's that's terrifying and obviously that's an understatement. Um, I'm glad your kids did not have to read those letters. Me too. <laughs> uh, fair enough. Um, that's a tough one to follow up on. <laughs> <laughs> Not the answer I was expecting. Right. Uh, so, in the event that you do come up with that memoir, <laughs> you can name it Sweet Hell on Fire for Serious this time. Because um, that sounds like that. That's. I'm glad you're better. Thank you. Um, the message of hope that you're speaking of. Uh, what if any advice these days with everything that we've talked about in your publishing record, would you offer to new authors or folks that just haven't really been able to break into uh, publishing quite yet? Anything you have a lot of experience. Is there anything that stands out? This is something good to know. Quite a bit, actually. <laughs> um, I just want to take all the baby authors and scoop them up and put them under my wing and be like, okay, it's okay. Mom is going to take care of you. The money flows toward the author. Do not pay people to publish you. Do not, I mean, do your research. Make sure you Google everybody who offers you anything. Read your contracts. Don't be afraid to say no. Don't be afraid to say, this is not what I want. People who don't act like Rising water floats all ships are people to be avoided at all costs. <laughs> um, oh, and for the love of God, for the love of everything holy and unholy, do not friend other authors and then ask them to like your page. Don't do it. <laughs> Drives me nuts. Um, and also, that's not those aren't the people you want to like your Facebook page anyway, because if you're going to run a Facebook ads, you want to show your ads to people who want to see your content and other authors, even if they're readers, which we all are or should be, we are not the ones that you're supposed to advertise to. We are not the super fans. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, that's a lie. Not liars. <laughs> they're trying I, I am a super fan. Like I fangirled all over Brian. So, I mean, <laughs> being, being a fan is good, but trying to, Try to cannibalize the authors. I, I totally agree with you. That's not uh, that's not particularly helpful. Plus, it's already kind of a group that's already well aware of you know what else is out there, and discovering somebody new is great. But trying to trying to pressure somebody into something that's not not going to be productive. So there's a whole wide world of readers out there that are not authors, and that's the market you're trying to reach. I completely agree with you there. Definitely. Okay, um, so Mama Bird's got all the all the baby authors under her wing, which is very hopeful. That's very nice. I mean, somebody took the time to help me, and they still do. You know, I'll have questions about, oh, so this algorithm has changed. What are we doing? And my friends will be like, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is how you run the ad. This is the keyword you use. And if they weren't helping me with that, I mean, I wouldn't be making the living that I am right now. Right. So. Do you mind explaining what an algorithm is to, to the folks that are watching this interview that might not know how the business works? Um, it's like the automation with Facebook ads or Amazon ads that decide who is going to see your ad or who is going to see your post. Right. And those change all the time. And so do the rules about what we can have in that ad, like different kinds of images. Um, sometimes the people who approve the ads think something is racy when it's not at all. And you have to adjust your marketing plan to go with that. 
even if it's unfair and even if it sucks, you just have to do the thing if you want to get your ad in front of people. You've got to, exactly. You've got to follow the rules or you will get nowhere. Um, exactly. What's, what's the best place to look for information, in your opinion, for somebody that wants to self-publish? And I'm a big proponent of self-publishing. We had a whole thing years ago after uh, Amazon came out with Kindle Unlimited and it just scattered my entire business plan for MB to the four winds. And then I told everybody like self-publish because you know, you're not going to get a detailed report from any publisher because Amazon's not supplying it. It's all crazy. Um, what's the best piece of advice you could give somebody looking to self-publish? Um, David Gogren's website. He has a bunch of free classes for anyone who's looking to get into self-publishing and you don't have to do anything. You just make a login and the information is just there for you to have and to go through at your leisure. Okay. What's that website if you don't mind? I believe it's davidgogren.com. Anything else you want to throw in there? My thriller, Tooth and Nail. It's about a woman who's a cop in Detroit who decides to leave the fast-paced life to be a small-town cop to work on building her relationship with her husband and maybe starting a family. And then she discovers that the serial killer that she's been hunting has followed her. And to make matters worse, she discovers that she's married to a serial rapist who works for the Kansas Department of Investigations. So. She knows that if she turns him in, nothing's going to happen. So she has to make that moral choice whether she's going to give him to the serial killer That's a cool or do things the right way. That is a cool twist. So she hunts serial killers and knows that this one followed her, but she doesn't yep. know why. And then she learns why. That's well, he's the only one she hasn't been able to catch. She's a part of several different task forces and several different teams that have brought down these other killers. So people have built her up to be sort of this icon, sort of like this Mindhunter character, but not really. We all know it takes more than just one person to catch someone like that. All right. Well, again, a big thank you uh, for, for joining us this evening. And uh, again, I'm going to post all of the, the websites that you mentioned so that people can get in touch with your work. And all of your books uh, are, are, they're all listed on Amazon, obviously. And uh, they can find out where else uh, to look for them on your websites. Thank you for, for thank you for having me. Joining us. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been uh, great to have you on. I appreciate it. And I can't wait to read your story uh, for Legends of the Werewolf Hunter. So we'll talk again soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Miles. So happy to have her on board with this. I, I really am. Um, we'll have more interviews for with our contributing authors in the coming months and weeks, uh, leading right up until publication or Halloween. Uh, so if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the channel because you don't want to miss those. Um, okay, so last month I counted down my top 10 werewolf films, and I always have a good time uh, putting those together for you. So this month I decided to point the top 10 list in another direction. Not my most hated werewolf films, uh, but my top 10 monster hunters. Now we've talked about these guys for the last few years that we've been, uh, we've been doing this and gone over a lot to do with them and their mythology everywhere, everywhere from you know, cave paintings up to comic books. And uh, since Sylvester and Michael belong to this rather exclusive group, uh, for obvious reasons, they will not be appearing on this countdown, on this top 10 list. But here are my top 10 uh, favorite monster hunters from, well, pretty much every medium. Here you go. Here is my top 10 countdown of my favorite monster hunters of literature, legend, and film. At number 10, Father Lancaster Marin from The Exorcist, the 1971 novel by William Peter Blatty, adapted to the screen in 73. Father Marin is most famously played by legendary actor Max von Sydow, both in the original film and Exorcist II, The Heretic. The character is played in prequel films by Stellan Skarsgård. 
Father Marin is introduced to us as an elderly priest and paleontologist on an archaeological dig in Iraq, where he finds images of the demon Pazuzu. He had previously faced the demon during an exorcism in Africa following the Second World War. Marin doesn't appear again until much later in the novel when he joins Father Damien Karras in Washington, D.C. to exorcise the same demon from the body of a young girl. Marin is a good example of a mortal man having the courage to face down something more powerful than himself, added to which is the element of faith, good versus evil, and perseverance even unto death, because Marin has a heart condition and dies during this last bout with the demon. At number 9, Beowulf. The titular character from one of the most important and most often translated works of Old English literature. Scholars aren't sure when it was put together or who wrote it exactly, only that the manuscript was produced between 975 and 1025 AD from an oral tradition. The story is set in 6th century pagan Scandinavia, where the hero, Beowulf, comes to the aid of the king of the Danes, whose mead hall has been under attack by the monster Grendel. Beowulf kills the monster with his bare hands and then goes on to face Grendel's mother who is even more frightening. Fifty years later, as king of the gates, he defeats a dragon and is mortally wounded. Unlike Father Marin at number 10, Beowulf is not an ordinary man. In fact, he's widely considered to be the first literary superhero. He is mortal, yes, but possesses humor, superhuman strength and endurance which enables him to contend with monsters on a more or less equal footing. For example, he uses no weapon against Grendel because he considers himself the monster's equal. So while Beowulf is a hero, he is not a god or a demigod like earlier monster killers like Thor or Hercules. Here again, the hero perishes in battle, but at an old age and against a dragon, I don't think Beowulf could have asked for a better death. At number 8, The Ghostbusters. The cultural phenomena of Peter Venkman, Ray Stance, Egon Spengler, and Winston Zeddemore was introduced to the movie going public to critical acclaim in 1984. A deftly blended mixture of comedy, action, and horror, the film earned almost $300 million during its initial theatrical run, making it the highest grossing comedy of all time up until that point. In case you've been living on the moon since the mid-80s, the Ghostbusters are a paranormal investigation and elimination service using high-tech equipment they've developed to capture and contain ghosts. Soon, business is booming as paranormal activity increases across New York City, building up to the film's climax where the boys in gray slug it out with an ancient Sumerian god and a hundred-foot marshmallow man. Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Harold Ramis, and Ernie Hudson gave us perhaps the most feel-good team ever. And while ghosts might not be considered monsters per se, there's enough man versus the unknown mojo and courage in the face of fear to make the cut all the same. Even though there was definitely a very slim chance they'd survive this, nobody steps on a church in their town. Number 7, Blade the Vampire Slayer. Created by writer Marv Wolfman and penciler Gene Colan for Marvel Comics, Blade's first appearance was in July of 1973 as a supporting character in the comic book The Tomb of Dracula. A human-vampire hybrid, Blade, whose real name was Eric Brooks, had devoted his life to ridding the world of all vampires, utilizing his unique physiology to become the perfect vampire hunter. In the years since the debut of Blade, the character has been substantially adapted from the comic books into films, television series, and video games. He was portrayed by actor Wesley Snipes in the films Blade, Blade II, and Blade Trinity. Marshila Ali is set to play the character in the upcoming Blade film set in the MCU. I've liked Blade since I was seven or eight years old, even before I could even read the comics. Uh, one look at this guy and I knew he meant trouble for vampires and so I've always been partial to his original street level incarnation with the overcoat and the bandolier of wooden knives and the green anti-hypnosis goggles over his more maniacal or theatrical version with the katanas and the black leather. His origin story was also heavily factored into my own series, specifically the nativity of Sylvester Logan James. At number six is Abraham Van Helsing, probably the most famous vampire hunter of all time. The character of Professor Van Helsing was created by Bram Stoker, an elderly Dutch doctor with a wealth of experience, education, and expertise, and the enemy of Count Dracula. Now, Van Helsing has been adapted for stage and screen as often as Dracula himself, and played by a variety of actors through the decades, each of them adding his own dimension to the character as he matches wits with the Transylvanian vampire lord. I don't include Hugh Jackman's character from the movie Van Helsing, not because it was atrocious, which it was, but because his name was Gabriel in that movie, not Abraham, and his coat and slouch hat were about as close to the real McCoy as he came. As much as I love Anthony Hopkins' portrayal 
as the vampire slayer in Bram Stoker's Dracula. And as much as I adore Peter Cushing's version of the role, my vote for best portrayal has to go to Sir Lawrence Olivier in the 1979 rendition starring Frank Langella as the Count. Even though they get the names mixed up and they blend characters and somehow Van Helsing becomes Mina Murray's father, Olivier's depiction was for my money the most believable and earnest of the lot. At number five, Solomon Kane. From the mind of Robert E. Howard, creator of Conan the Barbarian, also comes Solomon Kane, somber looking late 16th century, early 17th century Puritan who wanders the world with a goal to vanquish evil in all its forms. His adventures were published mostly in the pulp magazine Weird Tales back in the day, often taking him from Europe to the jungles of Africa and back. Howard described him as a tall, gloomy man with pale skin, a gaunt face, and cold eyes, all of which was perpetually shadowed by his broad-brimmed traveler's hat. He dressed entirely in black, and his weaponry usually consisted of a rapier, a dirk, and a brace of flintlock pistols. During one of his later adventures, an African shaman gave him a staff that served as a protection against evil, but could also be wielded as a weapon. The character of Solomon Cain is remorseless and steadfast in his campaign against evil men and creatures, and I drew inspiration from his uncompromising and relentless pursuit when it came to building the character of SLJ, and to a lesser extent the Reverend Blackscrabble. Cain's exploits with the supernatural world and different occult offices also made an impact on my own stories. At number four, The Ensemble from Penny Dreadful, a horrors television series created for Showtime. The series premiered in the United States in 2014 and ran three seasons until its main story arc had been completed. The series featured Timothy Dalton as Sir Malcolm Murray, father to one Mina Murray, Eva Green as Vanessa Ives, and Josh Hartnett as Ethan Chandler, to name just a few. The series drew upon many public domain characters from gothic fiction, including Dorian Gray, several characters from Dracula, Victor Frankenstein and his monsters, and Dr. Henry Jekyll. There's also a werewolf, an eccentric Egyptologist, an African warrior who was a former slaver, uh, witches, a host of vampires, and even a goddess of death. Now as noisy and cartoonish as this may sound, it is in fact brilliant. By far one of my favorite cable series of all time. Penny Dreadful with its all-star team of monster hunters should be required viewing for those new to the trade. Sir Malcolm Murray especially drives the hunt from every power at his command, wealth, prestige, position, and an intractable determination to destroy the fiend who took his daughter. If you've not seen it, you're in for a treat. At number three, Kolchak the Night Stalker. This was a television series that aired on ABC during the 1974 and 75 season. Followed the adventures of wire service reporter Carl Kolchak, played by the incomparable Darren McGavin. The series only lasted one season, but has achieved cult status and remained popular in syndication for years. The series followed two TV movies, The Night Stalker in 1972 and The Night Strangler in 73. Kolchak investigates mysterious crimes with unlikely causes that usually turn out to be the work of supernatural, alien presences, or legendary monsters. He is a talented and outspoken investigative journalist with an affinity for the bizarre, and he drives around Chicago in his yellow Ford Mustang convertible, snatching exclusives and collecting information with his compact camera and portable cassette recorder. Before there was Buffy, Scully and Mulder, or the Winchester brothers, there was Carl Kolchak. I would stay up late just to watch The Night Stalker and love the eerie and ominous whistling from its opening scene. Uh, Kolchak is probably the first live-action monster hunter to appear on network TV. And he was always afraid, but that never stopped him from chasing the monsters down dark alleys and through abandoned warehouses. And it wasn't just the story his editor would never print that he was after. Carl wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty and sometime dispatch the monster by himself. Number two, Quint. From Peter Benchley's 1974 novel Jaws and its 75 film adaptation comes the man with one name. Jaws, as you know, tells the story of a particularly large, voracious, great white shark that hunts the beaches and waterways of a small resort town and the voyage of three men set out to kill it. A professional fisherman and survivor of the USS Indianapolis disaster, as well as a veteran sharker, Quint, played by the redoubtable Robert Shaw in the film, is the captain of the vessel Orca and master of the hunt, alongside police chief Brody, played by Roy Scheider, and marine biologist Matt Hooper, played by Richard Dreyfuss. Quint is the essential working class hero, and it's Shaw's performance with its eccentricities and gravita that puts this character so near the top. 
Out of every monster hunter on this list, I feel like Quint is the most believable and therefore the most relatable. He's coarse, and he's a bit of a rounder, a hunter for hire, but this is his livelihood. But as the search for the big shark intensifies, Quint's personal past can be seen in his eyes, both the determination to outwit his prey and the fear that comes over him as he realizes his fate. Quint loses to the monster, as most monster hunters eventually do, but in the film he does it with a blade in his hand and his boat shoes on. He drowns in the novel, no doubt since after the Indianapolis he never put on a life jacket again. Number 1. Quincy P. Morris from the novel Dracula Texan Quincy Morris is a rich young suitor, one of three who proposed to Lucy Westerner. He carries a bowie knife with him at all times, and at one point he admits that he is a teller of tall tales who hasn't perhaps lived as a man should. Quincy is one of the few characters in the novel to have prior knowledge of blood drinkers, as he was forced to shoot his horse while in the pompous after vampire bats drank it dry during the night. He plays a crucial role in the climax of the novel because it's he and Jonathan Harker who finally destroy Count Dracula. And Quincy is gravely injured in that battle and dies shortly afterwards. Now, most film adaptations of the novel omit Quincy altogether or merge him with other characters, which is too bad. Now, my favorite portrayal of the character comes from Bram Stoker's Dracula uh, and Billy Campbell. In the film, Quincy's Bowie knife, for which he is perhaps best remembered, is an ornate blade with a gold-toned rhinoceros head for a pommel. And given the time period of the novel, I would expect Morris's buoy to be more in line to the Musso style, which was popular in Texas and throughout the American Southwest. So, a rough around the edges Texan who regularly packs a buoy knife, and as the novel states, has a kind of belief in a Winchester rifle, you can see why this man who drove his knife through Dracula's heart is at the top of my list. I bet you thought we were done. As an honorable mention, it's Mystery Incorporated, aka the Scooby-Doo Gang. Scooby-Doo Where Are You premiered in 1969 from Hanna-Barbera as a Saturday morning cartoon series featuring teenagers Fred Jones, Daphne Blake, Velma Dinkley, Shaggy Rogers, and their talking great Dane, Scooby-Doo. In their van they called the Mystery Machine, they solved mysteries supposedly involving supernatural creatures, but we'll get into that in a minute. Now, following the success of the original series, Hanna-Barbera and its successor, Warner Brothers Animation, have produced numerous follow-ups, spin-offs, including television specials and made-for-TV movies, a line of direct-to-video films, and two theatrical feature films. Now, this had to be on here somewhere, because this is Suspect Zero for me. Even before I knew I liked monsters, I knew I liked Scooby-Doo. Even though in its original incarnation, there really were no monsters, just generic villains in costume. They still looked good right up until the obligatory unmasking at the end. And it wasn't until Vincent Price led his voice to Vincent Van Gogh in The Thirteen Ghosts of Scooby-Doo that the real monsters finally showed up. That'll do it for me tonight. Thanks for stopping by and spending some time with us. Uh, feel free to drop me a line in the comment section down below or shoot me an email at brian at werewolfhunter.com. Until next month, happy hunting and mind the moon. <laughs>